Your, um, I, it just seems that lately, one thing after another in my studies, God reveals something to me, and I can tell that I'm on a path um, to really understanding what it takes and what I need to do to unlock the mysteries of God, unlock the power and authority of God that God wants each and every one of us to walk in. It was Jesus' full intent to multiply himself when he sent the Holy Spirit. It was his intent that all of us should walk in the same power and authority that he walked in, that we see the disciples having walked in, that we should all be walking in the same thing. And, uh, and it's available to us. And we just have to learn and grow and reach out for it. Amen? Amen? So last week I talked to you about this phrase that means basically that if you hear something over and over again, after a while, you don't really hear it anymore. Remember that? So I think that when you become a Christian for a long time, after a few years, you, that begins to really affect you. Isn't it amazing that Jesus said so many times, he says, they that have ears to hear, let them hear. And what he's talking about there is those that are willing to pay attention, lean in, pay attention closely and intently to what, what the Word of God says and what's being preached or you're reading or whatever, however you're getting the Word into you. Amen? If you really have ears to hear, then let them hear. So everybody had ears when he was talking to them. That's not the case. But he says, let them hear. In other words, you have to make that decision. And so when I get into the Word of God, and I know I've said this, but I want you to grasp this, you, you need to read the Word of God with, with, with fresh eyes, like you've never read that before. And if you, if, you, if you catch yourself not doing that, you have to stop, and I do this, I do this to myself, I stop and wait a minute, what did I just read? What did I just read? I remember a, uh, a man, uh, he had a, uh, a uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A, uh, a young man in his church that um, was, um, oh gosh, what's in his, um, what, what Jimmy has? Down syndrome. I couldn't think of it for some reason. Down syndrome. He had a, he, this young man had Down syndrome, but he kept wanting the pastor to let him preach, and let him preach, and let him preach, and the pastor was going to be out of town, and the young man said, can, can I preach? He says, well, I already have a, a guest speaker lined up for Sunday. He says, but I'll tell you what I'll do. We have, an audit, we have a separate uh, auditorium. It's a smaller one. It's like a cafe type area, right? A meeting room. He says, you can go ahead and have meeting there on Wednesday night if you want. Go ahead and you go ahead and do it. Just go ahead. I'll let you do it. The young man was all excited, right? And so the pastor was going to be gone for two weeks. So he goes and he's gone for two weeks and he comes back and the whole church is just all fired up and the young man had moved the meetings from that small room into the main auditorium and so he asked the, the assistant pastor, how come he's having his meetings there? He says, well, because he, they outgrew the, the other one. Really? Well, what's he preaching on? John 3.16. Well, yeah, but what else? No, just John 3.16. Every night? Yeah, because we had to go to every night because it was, the services were too full. True story. It's like, and he's only teaching on just John 3.16. That's the only scripture he's sharing. Yeah, it's the only scripture he shares every night. I mean, if you think about it, you guys could quote John 3.16 to me probably 10 years ago, however long you've been a Christian, right? But evidently, when you look at it with fresh eyes, it's like it's new every night. And that's what I'm trying to get at is this. So you, you have to do that. And, and I know some of you have been Christians for probably as long as I have or longer. You know, I've been a Christian for 46 years now, you know? And so when I get into the Word of God, and I've read it a lot. 
I have to do what I'm telling you. I have to say, okay, no, don't just read it. Stop. What is it saying? Carefully listen. Carefully look. What is it saying? See, I slow myself down, right? Absolutely. So that's what you have to do. And so I'm, that's what I'm asking you to do with this because I'm sharing with you some things that, that I can tell that, that would describe the treasure that was hidden in the field that Jesus said the man went and bought that treasure, that field, so he could get the treasure. It's great value. What we have here, I believe, is what God's trying to wake his people up to, that if you'll get this, you'll unlock the power of God in your life so you can operate in the power and the authority and the anointing that, that the disciples walked in. That's what I want in my life. Amen? Amen. So, with, um, let me just do a little bit of a recap and we'll get into this. So, first of all, John 14, 13. And this is this... Certain things, the scriptures that I've read, were keys that just exploded in me when I was reading these things, and this is one of them. This is the, the last real big one that hit me just recently. So here we go, John 14, verse 13. And whatever you ask in my, Jesus is talking, of course, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. That, that's a big statement. I mean, really, I mean, it's cut and dry. You can't really interpret that any other way. Jesus said, hey, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it for you. I remember the first time I read that, I thought that was a blank check. I really did. Verse 16, and I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. Well, why do I need a helper if anything I pray and ask in Jesus' name I get? It seems to me if that worked that well, I don't really need any extra help. Doesn't that make sense? I mean, if everything I pray, boom, I get it right now. Why? Because I said the magic word, Jesus. I don't need a helper. Well, evidently we do, and that's why he brought that up right after he made that statement, right? So I'm going to do whatever you want me to do. By the way, you need a helper. Why? It ain't going to work without him. Come on, right? He'll abide with you forever. Because you know what? In my life, it's probably going to take that long for him to get me right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay, verse 17. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Evidently, truth is one of the major things the Holy Spirit needs to show us. The world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So again, he makes this comment twice of that, I'll do whatever you want, uh, whatever you ask in my name to do. And so if you remember, I told you that, that what he's saying there, in name, that name there doesn't referring to the name Jesus, because that was a common name. It was referring to his character, who he is. See? So if we say Jesus, for you guys, you know that that means far more than just his name. That you identify who he is with that. If you know someone else, you know, then, then you identify that person, not just the name, right? If I say Frank's name, I'm, I'm not just thinking of his name Frank, I'm thinking of everything I know about Frank, right? So that's what he's talking about there, his character according to his values. And then he goes on to say that, that, that you have to be a reflection of him. That's what the Holy Spirit's job to do. Remember, I talked to you about that. So, so you have to be living this day. You can't just understand Jesus and know Jesus. You know, the devil knows Jesus, okay, right? But he doesn't have that nature. He doesn't have the nature of Christ. So that's why he said you have to keep his commandments. Second Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 1, Simon Peter, a bondford servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. You notice all those things that pertain to life and godliness come through the knowledge of Jesus. That's what he just told us. So it's, we have to pursue the knowledge of Jesus. That's the key. That's the key in all this, is pursuing the knowledge of Jesus. Verse 4 and by which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So, if we're going to grow up into the place where we get the answers to prayer that Jesus promised us, 
then we need to take on his divine nature. We need to study his nature, okay? You remember I told you that I was up in the, my office one time, and the Lord just out of the blue, tell you what, if the Lord doesn't speak to you just out of the blue, interrupt your day, boy, you need to have him do that. If you have ears to hear, he will. Because sometimes that's the best revelation you can get is when God suddenly just speaks to you, wow, okay? And, and it's sometimes the simplest things, but it's a huge revelation behind it, or he wouldn't tell you in the first place. How many know if God says something, it must be important? Of course. So out of the blue, he just says, you know, you don't trust somebody you don't know. I was like... Now, I could have said, well, duh, right? But I knew better because I knew that there was something there. And then it just hit me, oh my gosh. He's talking about himself. He's talking about himself. He's saying, you know, you're not going to trust me. You're not going to have faith in me if you don't know me. So my question to you, honestly, how much do you really know God? I mean, really. How much do you really know God? If I was to sit and tell you, I want you to tell me about God. Tell me what you know about God. And I don't want you to just quote, you know, those cliches. Well, God, God, God is love. He loves us. He died for us. Okay, I, I know all that. But tell me about God. What's he like? Now you're going to have to sit and think a little bit, maybe. Especially if I start pressuring you. Come on, there's more than that. Come on, right? Absolutely. So my question to you is, and again, this is challenging, I understand this, but my question to you is, are you really pursuing actively knowing more about God? If you're not, you're missing everything I'm talking about. And you might as well not believe that scripture when Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. Forget that scripture, just mark it off saying unattainable for me and move on with life and hope for the best. You got your ticket to heaven, and that's good enough. I know this is, I'm, I'm taking you guys someplace to, that God is taking me, and I'm taking you with me, okay? Those of you that will follow and those that will come along, okay? And that means that, that, that we have to challenge ourselves. Every growth you take is going to be outside your comfort zone, which means you're going to be uncomfortable, right? So, yeah, uncomfortable. Okay, so we need to get to know God better, right? That's where we're going to go in the next few weeks. We're going to get to know God better. We're going to get to know God better. 1 John 4, 8 says this. It says, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So do I know God? Do I love? If I don't love, I already answered it. I don't know God. Scripture says so. So then the question remains, how much do I love? How much do I love? Do I struggle with love? Do I know what love is? To know God, we have to know love. We have to have love. 1 John 4, 20. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. So if I love God, I can't be hating my brother. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? So if I think about the process of loving people, What does it take to love people? What does it take to love people? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must, also, must love his brother also. So, so now I'm back to, now I have to love people. Because if I don't love people, then I can't love God. And if I don't love, then I don't know God. And I'm not taking on his nature, then my prayers aren't going to get answered. Okay? So then, so, so what does it take for me to love people? Well, okay, well, what keeps me from loving people? That might be a good place to start, right? 
And this, this is off to the side. This isn't part of my message, so evidently God wants me to take this direction for just a minute. But what stops me from loving people? Unforgiveness? Sure. Bitterness? Anger? Hurt? Right? What stops you from loving people? Think of the person you hate the most. Oh, I don't hate anybody. Okay, think of the person you dislike the most. I got a few people I dislike. Why do you dislike them? What do you have to do so that you can love them? What's that going to take? Right? Because these are the things you're going to have to pursue if you want to love God. Does that make sense? We'll go on. So I see that in my relationship with God, loving people is involved. I get that, okay? So we have three aspects in this. Show the next slide. Is that the next slide? Okay, well, that's fine. Um, that, that's fine. First John 4, 19. We love God, we love him because he first loved us. Okay, so now I can see that there's a key here to loving God. I know one key is I have to love people. Another key is, is that, that we love, I love him because he first loved me. All right? So my, my one key to loving God and understanding God is that I have to understand his love for me. Okay? I have to first love others. And loving others comes before loving God. So at least in the progression, loving people is a part of it, right? Is there a step before that? I get to knowing God. Maybe there's a progression. Maybe I'm trying to start at the wrong end of it, right? So what's the step before loving others? Verse 19 tells us, 1 John 4, 19. We love him, like I said, before he first loved us. That's up there already. So now we have three steps here. Love God, love people, and God loving us. Another scripture I'm going to tie it together, so bear with me. 2 Timothy 1.7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Okay? Now, what I want you to understand is this is what that scripture is saying. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power. A spirit of love and a spirit of a sound mind. So he's given me a spirit of love. Okay? Now, 2 Timothy says that God, God gives us a spirit of love, and 1 John says God is love. So what we see here is, is that if he's given me a spirit of love, and God is love, what he's saying is he's given me of himself. He's given me of himself. If he's given me a spirit of love, he's given me a spirit of himself. Right? A spirit of himself. So, so in the progression, we see that God loves us first. And in order for, to, to love God, we have to love others. And we love God because he first loved us. It sounds like a puzzle. I get that, right? But we can connect the three pieces. And they go like this. First, God loves us more. Then we begin to love others more. And then we begin to see that we love God more. God love, God, I begin to understand the, the love that God has for me. I understand God. I start to know more about God. I understand God. And in doing so, it creates in me, because of that spirit of love, right, I begin to it overflow. It overflows. And I begin to see people through his eyes. I begin to love people more. And because I love people more, the Bible says I'm loving God more. Because he says you can't love me if you don't love your brother. See what I'm saying? And then it becomes a cycle. It becomes a cycle. Now, I want you to notice something. It says God loving me more. Well, God doesn't love you more. Okay? He already loves you completely. But what I'm talking about there is your knowledge of him loving you. The more I understand and, and gain knowledge of his love for me, the more I'm going to overflow with that and, and, re and receive that spirit of love that's how we get the spirit of love, is understanding how much he loves us. It overflows. It, we're reflection. We reflect what God puts inside of us. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the more you find out 
and, and experience the love of God in your life, the more you're going to love other people. And the more you love other people, then all of a sudden you realize, because I love people, I love God. And it, it's a cycle, and it grows. And it's, it, the more each thing grows, it grows to the next thing. Does that make sense? So that's what we have to happen. It has to, it has to happen that way. So, I can't get God to love me more, but there's one thing I can do, like I said, is gain knowledge of his love. And that's why the Bible is written. It's a love letter. And we've heard that said before, but act like you just heard it for the first time. The Bible is a love letter. It's all about God expressing to the human race his love for them. I remember one time I was in prayer and I said, Lord, um, oh no, he said to me first, he said, you know, everything that I did that's written in the Bible was an act of love. And I said to him, I said, boy, I can think of a few people in Sodom and Gomorrah that would probably think that's not true. Right? But it is true. It is true. Because of what was happening there, threatened the entire human race. There are times, and I don't want to get into this, another rabbit trail here, but the things that God did in the Old Testament that you see happening where people were wiped out and things like that, the flood and all that, is because the seed was threatened. The whole human race was threatened with what was going on. Sometimes you have to cut the cancer out. Okay? Think about this. God promised in the Garden of Eden that through the seed of the woman that salvation would come to, human, to the human race, right? Well, the human race got down to only one family left, Noah and his sons and his wife. And if they would have been taken out, that whole promise of God, the whole thing would have been a wash. It would have been over with, done. That was it. And think about the long-suffering of God. He, he was, God was, was always reaching out to humanity. That means oh, the whole world had turned away from God, the whole entire world except Noah and his family. God, God took the took a risk and took the seed lying down to one family left before he finally said, you know what, I, I, if I don't save that family, the whole thing's a wash. It's over with, done. The human race is lost forever. So he had to do that. So that's what I'm saying. So every act of God does is an act of love. We may not, under, not understand that, you know, but it's just like our kids. Our kids don't always understand the decisions we make, do they? Same thing. We're his kids, right? So, if a total stranger came up to you and said, I love you, first of all, that'd be kind of weird, right? But at the same time, would you believe them? No, because you don't know them and they don't know you. But if you got to know them more and got to know them more and they, and they said, I love you, then maybe if the relationship has went to that level, you know, and I'm not talking romantic love, I'm talking about just friendship love and, you know, and, and whatever, um, then you would believe them. Yeah. I have friends and I know they love me, right? Absolutely. You get to know them, you, you, you know that they love you. you know, but here's the thing, you understand that when they say they love you because you understand them. You've gotten to know them, right? Absolutely. So you have to know the person. I remember when Nicole was little, she would, she would sit on our laps and she would grab my face, and she did this to Johanna too, she would grab our face and turn it toward her, right? And she'd put her nose right on our nose and look right into her eyes and then she'd just giggle like crazy, you know? I still remember that, you know? Um, and so I think that we have to let God grab our face and turn it to his face and let him put his nose right on our nose. And if you do that, I think you might hear him giggle. You might hear him express some sort of love, amen? So you have to let God love on you. How much do you really honestly let God love on you? Well, how does God love on me? We'll get, that, we'll get to more of that in the next few weeks. But the thing is though, is do you even let him? Do you actually stop and say, okay God, the Bible says you love me, I'm open to that. Show me how you love me. God will show you. Why? He wants you to love him, and you can't love him if you don't realize he loves you first. So those are those precious promises that he talked about. Okay? So, 
So let God get your attention. Amen? As I prayed, I asked God to help me understand his love for me. And next thing I know, just God began showing me thing after thing after thing about his love. And, 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 and when I opened the scriptures up and started reading them, I, things started jumping out at me. And, and God will answer you. If you ask him to do that, he will answer you. Um, and so what he said to me, because I said, I, okay, I need to understand your love more for me. One of the first things he said was he said, you know, you can tell a lot about a person by what gives them pleasure. What gives them pleasure? So what gives God pleasure? Because see, I knew he was taking me on a path, and that was the first step in this path to understanding God more. He says, so you know, you'll, you'll know a person more if you understand what gives them pleasure. Doesn't that make sense? Absolutely. So what gives God pleasure? That would be the question, right? And God spoke to me and said, let me show you what gives me pleasure. And then he did. And next week I'll show you what it was. No, I'm just kidding. I'm going to show you now. <laughs> what does God take pleasure in? Luke 12, 32. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The kingdom represents everything about heaven. All the authority, all the power, all of who God is, all you are as a son and daughter of Christ. Join heirs with Jesus Christ, seated in the heavenly places, all of that. It's his good pleasure, good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Ephesians 1, 9, having made known to us the mystery of his will, this is his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. It's his pleasure to, to, to explain himself and to show you his will. Philippians 2, 13, that energy is God's energy, an energy deep within you. God himself willing and working at what will give him the most pleasure. God working on the inside of you, helping you to grow, helping you in your life, helping you to take on his nature, it all gives him good pleasure. Good pleasure. Ephesians 1.5, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, God could be a, a far-off God. He could be an, uh, a formal God, an impersonal God, and just be a God and we're the human race, and therefore we worship him, and he bestows upon us blessings as he sees fit. But no, he says, no, I want you to be a part of my family. And you've heard that a million times, but you should hear that for the very first time. Think about that. God wanted you to be a part of his family. That's why I say, to say I'm a Christian doesn't mean as much to me but when I say I'm a child of God, there is a big difference. So if somebody asks you if you're a Christian, you should say, no, I'm a child of God. Or, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I'm also considering myself a child of God. You can clarify so they understand, but think about that. You need to identify yourself as a child of God. A Christian sounds too impersonal. Ephesians 1.9, having made known to us the mystery of his will, did I read that one already? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, I think I did, 2 Thessalonians 1.11, Therefore we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith and power. Again, it's all God's good pleasure to be working in you, developing you. It just, it's the same thing as you do with your kids. When they're little, what are you doing? You're sitting down, you're teaching them their ABCs, you're teaching them how to count, you're teaching them how to put on their clothes, how to tie their shoes. I mean, all these things you do as a parent because you love your kids and you want to see them develop into their full potential. You make them sit and do their homework, right? All of that, absolutely. And that's what it's saying here. That's God's good pleasure to be your father and to train you and to teach you and help you to grow. Now, this is stuff you probably already know, but you should know it for the first time. You should understand it for the first time. You should think about this for the first time. These scriptures will only impact you to the extent that you allow them to. I want to say that again. These scriptures I just read to you will impact you only to the extent that you'll allow them to. So you should go back over and read those again. Because like I said, you've heard them before. I know you have. But you have to consciously receive them into yourself. 
If you do, they'll begin to take on a new form, a new, a new life to them, okay? You'll begin to grow more and more into them than you ever did before. They'll humble you. They'll cause you maybe to repent of your sins. You have to get to the place where, you, where, you're, where you're living for something more than yourself. If it's just about yourself, you gotta take it to heaven, just relax and ride the wave. But if you wanna live for something more than yourself like Christ did, then you have to, you have to stop thinking of you. And if you're, if, you're, if you're at that place where life just doesn't seem to be going right and everything, it's probably because you're not, you're, you're trying to live for yourself instead of live for something bigger than you. Because like I said, I've been a Christian for 46 years. I became a youth leader Within a year after becoming a Christian, I was a youth leader at our church because I, was, I just went full, full into this, you know, and never, never, never slowed down. Because I realized, like the lamb that was lost, I was lost and he found me. I've served God for 46 years. Now, I'm not trying to blow my own horn, don't get me, I'm just trying to give you an example. Johanna and I are pastors of the church because of the gratitude that we have in our heart for what he did for us. And if you don't really on a daily basis think about that, you're missing what I'm saying and you won't grow. I'm giving that to you right up front. If you don't think about, I know I'm pounding this into you, but please do that this week. Stop and say, I'm gonna get alone for a minute. I'm gonna think about what God's really done for me. You, you need to do this. If you're not, you're missing it. And again, it's not gonna work for you, right? It's just not gonna work for you. So let's go on. The next thing God told me, he said, to understand a person, find out what excites them. Not what just gives them pleasure, but what, what do they get excited about, right? What do they get excited about? Now I know there are certain things that Johanna gets excited about, and there are certain things that I know she gets excited about that, that I don't have a clue. So as a man, this might be a good advice for, for you husbands, I don't buy Johanna clothes. No, no. Because what I would buy for her, she'd look at that and go, I'm not wearing that, right? But I know it gives her pleasure. I know it excites her when she goes and buys some new clothes, right? I don't buy her jewelry. Because I would pick out something and she'd go, nah, no. But there's other things that I know she likes, right? So find out what, 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 what does God get excited about? What excites God? You mean God gets excited? If you look at these scriptures that I'm gonna share here, it will blow you away. If you really use your imagination and think about what I'm about to share with you here. Deuteronomy 30 ver, verse nine says, the Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. So it says that God rejoices. That means he's excited, okay, right? So, so okay, now, but how do I understand? What is that talking about there? It's really interesting. Like I said, if you get into some of the Hebrew, it's, the Hebrew language is probably the best language in the world. It really is, because it, it really explains things and, and, and paints a picture far more colorful than what the English language can. So anyway, the word rejoice there is the Hebrew word sus, which means to be bright, cheerful, and joyful. To be bright, cheerful, and joyful. Okay, so if I'm gonna take that and look at that, then I have to think, okay, that means that God, when he's rejoicing over something, and it says he rejoices over me, that it makes him bright, cheerful and joyful. So in other words, God's sitting on his throne, see, this is how I use my imagination, he's sitting on his throne, he's busy doing stuff, and then he thinks of Mike. It's just like you when you think of your kids. You brighten up, just like, yeah, amen? Come on guys, I can hear something from you all sitting here, okay? Bright, cheerful, in other words, he brightens his day. You brighten God's day. You mean God has, has bad days? I'd probably give him a few, you know? Yeah, 1 Chronicles 16, 31. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad and let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. 
right? Like the word the rejoice there is the Hebrew word gil, gil, which means to spin around under the influence of violent emotion. To spin around under the influence of violent emotion, usually rejoicing and full of gladness. That's how they rejoice in heaven, including God. So when God thinks of you, you imagine, you have, it's not imagining something that isn't real. You have to get this. I'm hoping you guys can have an imagination to go with me on this. This is not imagining something that's not real. This is, ima this is getting you to imagine and to see with vision what really does happen. This really does happen, okay? And there's other scriptures that use that same word when it's talking about the Father. He jumps up onto his throne and spins. Well, I thought God sat there, you know, regally with, you know, his beard and, uh, you know, a staff maybe, you know, and uh, angels around him and putting out judgment and all. No, no, he's our father. He jumps to his feet and spins around violently, violently with excitement and gladness. So imagine yourself, you walk into the throne room boldly like it tells us to do, right? God says, hold off everybody, Mike just came in. He jumps up, woo! Come on, woo, Mike's here, everybody, hey, come on, yeah! And all heaven goes, yeah, Mike's in the throne room. It's true though, it's not, don't, it's not, I'm not telling you something that doesn't happen. It says it right here. That's how they rejoice in heaven. First Chronicles 16, 32, let the sea roar in all of its fullness, let the field rejoice in all that is in it. The word rejoice there is the, is the Hebrew word alatz, alatz, which means to jump for joy, to jump for joy. So how, they, how do they express excitement in, in, in heaven? They jump, they jump for joy. They're, it's very animated, it's very animated. If you try to understand this and begin to use your imagination, you should this week stop and, and imagine yourself walking into the throne room and God doing that. Matter of fact, you should do it all the time. Pretty soon you'll begin to realize God gets excited over me. God gets excited over me. If God had a tattoo on his arm, it would say Mike. I'm serious. It would say Mike. Come on. All creation echoes what God does and it excites him. Psalms 104, verse 31. The glory of the Lord shall endure forever. The Lord shall rejoice in his works. And the Bible says we're his workmanship. The Lord rejoices over his works. The word rejoice there is a Hebrew word uh, samak, samak, which means to brighten up, to make glad and make merry. Why do they need so many different words to express God's excitement over you? Evidently, his excitement over you is very complex. Come on. If you start, you need to focus on these things, guys. You do. If you start focusing on them, you'll get to know more about him. And when something happens in your life, you're not going to doubt, is God around? Does God love me? Or if you make a mistake in life, does God still love me? Yeah, he still loves you. You make God glad and you make him merry. He brightens up. He's excited over the works of his hands. What excites God? Let's go on. Isaiah 65, 6, 17. For behold, I create the new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall be, not be remembered, nor come into mind. But ye be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. When God talks about his actions, the word rejoice there is, is the Hebrew word gil. Gil or gaul is another way to pronounce it. It means, again, to spin around under the influence of a violent emotion, be excited. He says, I rejoice and, and take joy. I spin around, I get excited. I can't sit still when I think about my people. Do you know that God can't sit still when he thinks about you? Come on, he, he can't sit still. When, when, I, when I see my grandkids, 
they know. I can come into the room and I'll stand there and one of them will catch, the, I'll catch their eye and they know what they have to do. They need to get over here and give me a hug. And, so, and, so, and sometimes I'll go, um, you know what you haven't done? And they'll go, give you a hug, right? And so Sarah, my granddaughter Sarah does this a lot. She'll, she'll see me in the room and, sh and she'll come up and says, you know what I haven't done? And I go, what? She'll give you a hug. So then she'll jump, sometimes violently. Hannah, my other granddaughter, you got to watch out when she goes to give you a hug because she runs and she dives like a football player into your arms and you got to hang on tight or she's going to bang her head against yours. You better be careful when God wants to give you a hug. I'm telling you that right now because he's going to run fast. Amen? He's going to run fast. And think about the, 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 the Holy Spirit in your life. When God said in that moment that it was the day of Pentecost for the Holy Spirit to come to the human race to rescue us, come on, are you ready? When the moment that God said, okay, it's time, Holy Spirit, go, the Holy Spirit was moving so fast they heard the sound of a roar of a train or a, a thunder. The Holy Spirit broke the sound barrier when he was coming to the earth. He was moving fast. Why, why would there have to be a sound? He was moving fast. Maybe that's my imagination, but you should have one too. He was moving fast. When God, the Bible says he hastens to perform his word. You mean God, the creator of the, the universe, gets in a hurry when I'm praying his word? Who am I? That my father would leap up onto his throne and say, excuse me guys, I gotta get something done here, and he rushes out of the throne room? He hastens to perform his word? Over you? Who are you? There must be something special, right? You need to think these things and get to meditate on those things. See, we love him because he first loved us. And if we don't love, we don't know God. If you don't know God, you can't take on his, his nature. If you can't take on his nature, your prayers aren't going to get answered. Let a double-minded man not, not think he'll receive anything from God. He gets excited over his people. Here's one. I love this one. Zephaniah 317, the Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one, everybody say mighty one, mighty one. Will, save. will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. God rejoices over you with singing. Have you guys seen some of these scriptures before? How many have seen these scriptures before? Think about the ones, if you haven't, and I'm, no condemnation, I'm just saying, that means there's a lot in the Bible that you haven't discovered. Me too, of course. I'm just saying, though, boy, my gosh, these are awesome. There's treasures in the Word of God that are waiting for you to uncover. Just break the thing open and start reading. Amen? So, so think about this. He rejoices over me with singing, and that's not all, it gets better. The first word for rejoice there is the Hebrew word sus again, like I said before, to be bright, cheerful, and joyful. In other words, when God looks at it, me, he bri it brightens his day, he lights up. The second word rejoice there, where it says he will rejoice over you with singing, that word is, is the word uh, gil again, to spin around under, under violent emotions of, of, of joy and gladness. And then he begins to sing over you. The word singing there, you ready? Is the word renal, 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 which means to shout, sing, cry, proclaim in triumph. It's a shrill sound as if the person was sounding, shouting so loud they lost control of their voice. God is so excited that his voice gets so high if, if for, in, in our analogy, for us, it would be that we're, our voice is, is cracking so much because the emotion that is driven behind our voice is so loud that, that we're losing our voice over it. Oh, come on, people. 
God gets that excited over you that he's shouting and, 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 and jumping and spinning and excited so much so that it's at the top of his voice. That's how God reacts towards you. Another part of that, when it says that he sings over you, is it's like when a mother is holding their child when they're little and they're singing over them to comfort them and to give them peace. Maybe the child's colicky or whatever, you know, what it doesn't matter, right? And the, and the mother is, is that, that connection between a mother and their child. God's holding you in his arms and he's singing over you singing over you to comfort you and to give you peace. See, are you getting to know God a little bit more? Come on. And the more you know about how much God loves you, the more you're going to love. This is, it's, it's the same spiritual principle that I taught you before, and I'm going to give it to you again, because it's, and I do that because people online may never heard this before. But if you remember, I said to you that if I had $20 in my pocket and you, you stole $10 from me, right, that would hurt. And it might make me angry because all I have to my name is $20. Or flip it around, you only have $20 in your name and I steal $10 from you. You'd be pretty upset. That's all you had to your name was $20 and I just took half of it. That'd be, make you pretty upset because I created a lack in your life. But now, imagine you have a big pocket, but imagine you had $20 million in, tw in, in $10 bills in your pocket, and I stole just $10 again. Would you be as mad? No. Why? I didn't create a lack. You might be upset that I would do that, because you probably would have given me a lot more if I just asked. I get that. But I'm just saying, the emotion behind me taking it wouldn't be nearly as great as if, you, if I created a lack in your life. If you're filled with the love of God so much because you've gotten into his word and you begin to know it and understand it and, and think about it and allow it to permeate you, it builds up that spirit of love on the inside of you, then remember I said what keeps you from loving people? Hurt, bitterness, pain. That lack that they did in your life, it's because they created a lack in your life. They hurt you, they betrayed you, whatever right? But if you're overwhelmed with the love of God so much, and you've got $20 million worth of love, if you will, you know, on the inside of you, and they took $10 worth of love out of you, because on a scale of God's love to, to people's love, that's what it would be like. It wouldn't create a lack in your life. Okay, you betrayed me, but you know what? I'm just so filled with God loving on me so much that you didn't create a lack in my life. I'm not worried about what people think of me because God loves me and I know what he thinks of me. Right? Bitterness? No, it doesn't matter because I'm too close to God right now. You know, I'm getting too much from him to anything you do or say is not going to bother me a bit. Right? It'd be like if your, a two-year-old comes up to you and calls you a, a, you know, a fuddy-duddy. Oh, wow, that hurt. Why? I'm thinking, you're a two-year-old. <laughs> That's not going to hurt me. When you're filled with the love of God in your life, anybody on this earth would be like a two-year-old to you. No matter what they say, no matter what they do, it won't matter. Because you're filled with the love of God in your life. Revelation, almost done here. Revelation 19, verse 4. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts, this is up in heaven, fell down and worshipped God um, that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, hallelujah. And the voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all his servants, and all ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a multitude, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. That word there, rejoice, there is allegalio. Allegalio is a different word than I've showed you before. It's a compound word made of agen, which means much, and the word holomia, holomia, which means to jump and to gush and to leap and to spring up. 
You put these words together in a picture of someone who's so excited, again, that they're jumping all over the place, shrieking and, and screaming with excitement over the marriage of the Lamb, over you guys. You're, you're the bride of Christ. And that day is coming when he looks forward to when we all leave here and we go to heaven and the marriage supper of the Lamb starts. That's, that's, the, that's what he's going to be doing. That's what God's going to be doing. Why? Because her bride has made herself ready. See? You have to know God. And how do you know God? What excites him? What gives him pleasure? It's God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's his good pleasure to work on the inside of you, to develop you, and to train you as his children. It's his excitement over you. He's so excited over you that, that every thought that he has towards you. The, you know, the Bible says that his thoughts toward us is like the sand on the seashore. He has that many thoughts about you. And some of this may be, and, and, and I get this, I get that, 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 that this can be kind of overwhelming, but it's like anything else, you have to work at it. You have to work at it. And so that's what I challenge you. I challenge you this week, think about these things. Stop and stop. What I would love to do next week if I ask you, did you guys take a time, get away from everybody else for a few minutes, and just meditate on what I talked about, and ask God to, to, to just show you how much he loves you? I would love to see every hand go up. If you start doing this, but here's the thing, a lot of Christians, they go to church on Sunday morning, they listen to the sermon, and they go home, and they totally forget about what was, what was talked about there. Totally forget about it till the next week. If you do that, you're not growing, and you've, you've, you've sabotaged the entire process that God's trying to do in your life to grow you into mature followers of Christ. Amen? You have to meditate on the word. Not just read it, but meditate on it. Think about it in your mind. Amen? So I'm hopefully getting something. I'm going to continue on. There's a lot of different things in the Bible that he describes about God that God downloaded to me. Because the next thing he says, you know, you know more about somebody if, right? And then he's, he's, told, he's told me other things too. So I'll be sharing those with you too. So we're going to get to know God better. Amen? Amen. And to know God better, then you can begin to have faith in him and take on that same nature. Amen? Go ahead and stand up, guys. So, praise God. God is good. Hallelujah. I, uh, you can go ahead and take it, Wyatt. Thank you so much. I appreciate you, bro. Whenever we think about receiving from God, um, when somebody prays for us, we have to, first thing we have to do is, is not discount ourselves. Because a lot of times we just qualify ourselves, you know. Oh, you know, you didn't get that answer to prayer because of this, 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 and this. And, you know, and I, I get it. I get we can sabotage things. But, but at least the first step you have to take is being totally convinced of God's good will towards you. You have to be totally convinced God has a good will towards you. If you can get that down, that's the first step. Then, then I realize if he has good will toward me, then that means what he does in my life is for my good. It's for my good. Amen? He wants the best for me. Amen? And he doesn't want me hurting. He doesn't want me in pain. He doesn't want me sick. He doesn't want me suffering in life. He wants me to, Jesus came, said I came to give life and life more abundantly. Right? So if we understand the love that he has for us, understand his good will toward us, and understand that he wants abundant life in our life, then we can come and receive with uh, a lot easier the answer to prayer than if we come with condemnation on our minds. Does that make sense? Okay. So anyway, I want to open the altar up if you need prayer. Be totally convinced that whatever your need is, God wants to meet that need.